imagine your party just won your country's election and you've been appointed Minister of Finance. However, instead of getting to enjoy the honeymoon period, you find out that the previous government has been lying about the state of Greek debt, threatening not just the future of Greece, but of the entire European Union. How do you announce that, how do you announce that revelation and how do you go to, about recovery from there? Quite a difficult situation, isn't it? A difficult one indeed, but our guest today had to go through all of that. He came to government and had to announce that the previous government has been lying about the numbers of Greek debt. Now, as a professor at the European University Institute, he's here to share his insider story, as well as critical insights on the crisis and on the role of Europe. Prepare to be captivated by a story not only about numbers and policies, but about tough decisions and leadership. Without any further ado, please welcome on our stage, Giorgios Papagostantino. Welcome, thank you. Captivated, oh my God. <laughs> It's a high bar. <laughs> well, we'll do our best. Uh, so welcome to room for discussion, Georgios. Uh, when we look at your resume, it's quite a diversity in occupations. A researcher, a politician, academic, now at the European University Institute. Which of those do you most closely associate yourself with? Okay, so first of all, many, many thanks for the invitation. It's, it's a particular pleasure to be here, not least because uh, within my family, there are two bachelor degrees and two master's degrees from UVA. So, uh, you know, I feel a bit at home here. None of which is me. It's my wife and my two sons. So, that's a, it's a difficult question to answer in the sense that uh, I think that the different roles define you in different parts of your life. So, I would, I would not say that I would identify with the politician label because I was never a career politician. I was a technocrat. I was an economist doing policy and advising. Then I got dragged into politics. I ran for elections. I, I did all the sort of door-to-door -door and uh, cafe-to-cafe bits that the elections entail. And then I got saddled with the, the, I did the European Parliament as well, and then I got saddled with the, you know, the, the, the job which at the time uh, someone qualified as the, the toughest job in Europe. So obviously that has defined my life, and, uh, but I would not say, and many people would not say that I'm a politician. They would say that I'm a bit of a technocrat uh, that happened to do politics. Yeah, so about that, if I think about academics, I think about somewhat more analytical, meticulous thinking, whereas politics is often much more fast-paced and much more negotiation. How, do you, how did you marry those two sometimes different skill sets together? So I think part of the problem with politics uh, is that people who are in it and uh, see it as a bit of a career often do not have the analytical background to be able to uh, have evidence-based policy prescriptions. At the same time, part of the problem with the technocrats that end up doing politics, they don't have the sense, the political sense, of how it's not just about designing a good policy, but it's also the narrative, how you explain it, how you convince people, how you carry them with you, or how you lose them eventually, right? So. That combination is very elusive, but I think it is exactly that combination that we should be having. In other words, good policies that are grounded on solid analytical uh, work and on evidence-based uh, thinking, at the same time, a narrative and understanding, emotions, policies is, politics is a lot about emotions, empathy uh, that make you an effective uh, uh, policymaker in difficult circumstances. Well, you mentioned that you happen to become a politician you know, a bit randomly. Then would you say that all your career choices have been spontaneous decisions? Okay. Um, have there been spontaneous decisions? I wanted to be an economist from when I was quite young and that's, I pursued that. Uh, I wanted to do policy uh, from, I mean, even when I was doing my PhD in economics, I was not thinking that I would do a purely academic career. I was interested in the policy questions. So I went to the OECD and I did policy work. But at the back of my mind, there was always this kind of thing about doing the real politics mm -hmm. part. Mm -hmm. So 
I, I, I would not say that this was kind of predetermined. Uh, luck had a lot to do with it. And, and at some point, you know, you are asked to jump and you either do it or you don't. I had come back to Greece to actually be a policy advisor to the Greek prime minister. And then at some point, uh, I, you know, his chief of staff said, you know what, why don't you present yourself at the next elections in this district up northwest where your family is from? And I could have just said, no, 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 this is not for me. I'm, I'm just a, a technocrat. And I said, yeah, which means that, you know, there must have been something there. Yeah, well, speaking about your political career, uh, we would like to take our audience now on a bit of a time travel machine, basically, in your life. So it's October 2009, and you were just appointed Minister of Finance in the newly formed government. And you realized, well, the Greek debt is way too high, and, you know, we should, uh, we should do something about it. And you announced the real numbers, which obviously sent shockwaves through Europe. And not many people can really say that their words kind of triggered a crisis. Looking back to it, do you regret being in that position at that certain time? You, you know, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a word in Greek, which I'm sure many of you know, which is called hubris. You know, you, you cannot, if you've been given the opportunity to be in the center of a historical event as major, not just for my country, but more broadly, as that was, you can't go back and say, oh, I wish I had dodged it, you know? And I wish I was in a more a quieter, in a quieter period and I could have done it, sure. But at the same time, I wouldn't dare say that. Um, we kind of knew that the situation was bad before we won the elections. We didn't know how bad it was. And frankly, you know, when you are in the middle of an election campaign, all you see is, is the, the election result. And then you may have, you have, you're second guessing things, but you are a bit of an over optimist, thinking, yeah, I can handle this, right? So, and then you arrive, and indeed, there was a moment, uh, which I describe in, in, in my book about the crisis, where uh, I would, as a very fresh, young finance minister, without prior government experience, sort of have around the table all the people from the ministry and asking them, you know, so what, where are we the expenditures and where are we the revenues? And every day there were more skeletons coming out from the closet. And at the end of every day, I would turn to them and say, is this it? And there would be this little hand from the back of the room saying, actually, minister, there's this additional <laughs> 600 million, which we haven't quite accounted for, and it should really be in the accounts. And I would do this the next day and the next day. So when it all added up, we realized that we had a deficit, which was uh, about 12% of GDP, whereas the outgoing government pretended it was 6% of GDP, and a few months before, it pretended it was 2% of GDP. So between 2 and 12, you have 10 percentage points of GDP. You can't, you know, this is more than major to get to miss your fiscal accounts by 10 percentage points of GDP. Now, we were not the only ones who missed that. There's uh, a responsibility also with our European partners, but we'll get to that later. But we certainly, as a country, I wouldn't say missed it, because it was clear that the previous government uh, tried to do its best to not show the true fiscal figures. They basically did statistical fraud. And I, I use the words that the European Parliament has used to describe this in the report that they did about it. And when we, we, we arrived at, and we realized the situation, there was no choice of not telling the truth. If we had not told the truth, because many people exposed said, oh, you know, you could have simply put some things under the, under the rug and not be so forthcoming and you shouldn't have spooked the markets. This is completely wrong for a number of reasons. One, the numbers were coming out anyway. This, the Bank of Greece, which had the, 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 the real numbers, was, was uh, uh, finally uh, telling the truth. And also, if you are economical with the truth, it's going to come back and bite you two months down the road. And then you will have lost complete credibility with your European partners, with the Greek population. You know, you're there, you know the numbers, you have to come out and you have to announce them, which is what we did. And then events followed. Mm -hmm. So about those numbers, you've described them previously as a, quote, runaway train. Can you walk us through some of the stations that train passed before <laughs> running away? 
Okay, now to be, you know, if, if I want to be uh, uh, honest, and I do want to be honest, um, the, the problem with the Greek fiscal accounts goes back decades, right? Uh, it's not something that happened magically over the last five years before we came to power. Uh, for a long time, the debt to GDP ratio was hovering around 100%, right? Uh, why was it steady? Because it was steady, because both the numerator, the actual debt, and the denominator were growing. So, but that's a very precarious balance. Once your economy stops growing, as it did in 2008, then your debt to GDP shoots, shoots up. Yeah. So we should have known this and we should have done something about it, but both parties, both big parties at the time, so our center-left party and the center-right before us, were kind of content to have a system whereby you, know, you kind of hand out money without much accountability and then you get back votes, right? Now, Unfortunately, in the five years before we came, this completely exploded. So, uh, and, uh, and this was not just one issue. You know, some people say, oh, the Olympics that Greece did in 2004. No, no, it's not just one particular. It is an endemic problem of not knowing how to make a budget. I, I, I'm kind of embarrassed to say it, but the first time the Greek state learned how to do a budget is, was in 2009, 2010, when we had the, the, the European Commission, the IMF, and the European Central Bank help us figure out the, bank, the, the accounts. You had situations where hospitals would spend, and at the end of the year, send the, 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 the bills to central government. And then we would look at the bills and say, yeah, but actually we, we told you that you could spend up to X, and you spent three times X. <laughs> and they would say, well, sorry. And you would have to then pay that money because these were real receipts from providers. So there was no system, especially when you go beyond the central government. You go what's called the general government, meaning not just the ministries, but also the public companies, the local authorities, hospitals, etc. There was zero system of accountability for expenditures. And there is an endemic problem of tax evasion in the country, which means that revenues, on the revenue side, uh, every year you had a big black hole uh, with a lot of uh, tax evasion on all levels, from the small guy to the doctor, the electrician, and the plumber, and the lawyer, all the way to large corporations. So everyone was kind of being economical with their uh, uh, revenues truth. So all this in a system which, and, and behind the system, is a basic failure of governance because it means that your state is not functioning. Uh, there is no accountability, there's no transparency, there is no controls, uh, the parliament isn't doing its job, civil society isn't doing its job. Uh, and one of the first things that we did actually is we passed a law, and this was even before the bailout, to say if a public expenditure is not online, it's not legal, okay? Yeah. So complete transparency. Anyone who spends, that we created a very simple website, has to upload that expenditure. If it's not uploaded, it's just not legal. And that, that very simple law uh, actually you know, made people look and see where the expenditures were, and also forced uh, the ministries and the local authorities and everyone to be, to be careful what they were doing. Yeah. Um, so in hindsight, uh, and about talking about this um, like quite structural problem, is there anything that previous governments could have done, or is the problem so structural that it was due for a large crash? Look, they could have done a lot of things. Uh, by the time we were in 2009, it was too late to stop a runaway train. I could explain why, and simply say that you know, 80% of expenditures were inelastic, in the sense that yeah. there were wages, uh, pensions, uh, you know, run, running various public services, you can't stop those, except if you've done serious structural reforms before, right? But I don't want to, to pretend it's just a fiscal issue because under, underlying it, there's also a problem of the Greek economy not having adapted since it got into the Eurozone to the realities of being in a, in a currency area where you cannot use your currency devaluation to become more competitive, and therefore it was getting increasingly uncompetitive, and this was also 
a big part of the problem. So it's not only fiscal, it's a broader issue, it's a question of structures, and it's a question of institutions. Yeah, and we will touch for sure upon that later in this interview, but you know, speaking of um, non-fiscal issues, PASOK, the party we're government with, has been a key player in Hellenic politics since it became a modern democracy in 1974. But many people attribute the Greek problems of corruption or clientelism partially to the brand of politics they've been promoting throughout the years. How would you then see PASOK's role in the lead-up to the crisis? <laughs> so the, I, I, I'm very glad that I anticipated this by saying both parties, right? <laughs> because I, I don't want to pretend that the party that I was part of uh, was kind of innocent to the crime, right? Uh, this was this permeated the political system. This this uh, system of favors, uh, this hiring people in the public sector simply on political grounds uh, when they were not needed. Uh, the system of giving increases in salaries to the people that shouted the most, uh, or where you could get most. Well, this was in both political parties, right? And and part of the problem that I had as finance minister when we started doing the tough stuff is because my own political party was apoplectic about it because this was completely different, antithetical to what they had been used to doing for, for the last 20 years. So I'm blaming the previous guys, the conservative government, for having created a runaway train, but I'm not absolving my own party from its uh, responsibilities of generating a system that allowed this to happen. Yeah. Um. So your party won the election October 9th, 2009, and on October 21st, Four. October 4th, yeah, you're right, sorry, that's, um, keep me sharp. Uh, October 21st, you announced that uh, the previous government lied about the Greek deficit. Did you make that decision yourself? Um, I, you no, know, I made that decision together with the prime minister, uh, and I made that decision after this kind of extensive discussions internally and discussions also with the, with the central bank governor uh, who had uh, kind of flagged the problem privately but not publicly. Uh, and uh, in fact, I asked him to go out and announce the numbers because I did not want this to be a political event. I wanted this to be a technical event. I wanted somebody to come and say the real numbers not because we just won and wanted to blame our predecessors, but we wanted them to hear it from an independent entity. And indeed, there is in, in an impromptu interview, uh, actually press conference, we both came out and the central government said, you know what, it's 12 and a half percent. Sorry. <laughs> Basically, the, 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 the deficit was increasing about one percentage point every month. So, uh, you know, you can do the math. And was this decision uh, shared by your cabinet or ministry? Yes, uh, we had uh, cabinet meetings where I explained the numbers. Uh, but you know what? Uh, in these situations, the truth is that the finance minister is a very lonely person. Yeah. Everyone kind of understands the problem, but nobody really feels it. Because when the meeting is finished, you're the one who's got, got to go back to the ministry and sort of deal with the consequences of that. They are, of course, also affected, and they realize this when I had to negotiate the budget for 2010 mm -hmm. and had to cut in every ministry from education to health to whatever. Uh, but they, you know, they feel, okay, it's not really, it's, it's George's problem. And did it's you ever feel so abandoned then? A, a little bit, but this is the fate of all finance ministers, right? It's the finance minister, to a certain extent, the prime minister, because at the end of the day, he has, she has overall responsibility. The other ministers try to sort of not be in the picture. So after October 21st, you had to get your hands dirty. So during your mandate, Greek deficit fell by 6% of GDP, uh, and you negotiated the first and most crucial deals with the Troika, considering of the, uh, consisting out of the ECB, IMF, and uh, EU Commission. Uh, can you walk us through some of the key policies uh, that it were able to achieve this and some of the challenges you faced trying to achieve them? Okay, so first of all, what's interesting, and maybe we'll come back to that when we talk about Europe more, is that we went through six months where we were telling our European partners, it's not just a Greek problem, right? It's a broader European problem. We are just the canary in the coal mine. Uh, we just happen to be the weak link, but the problem is broader. It's systemic. And you guys need to give a systemic and overwhelming European answer to this. It's not enough us just slashing our wrists and reducing expenditures. 
And it took a long time for this message to come through. We'll come back to that. But the actual negotiations and the, uh, uh, you know, there's no handbook for this, right? We sat down to negotiate a deal which gave Greece 110 billion euro in exchange for a very tough three-year program that involved cutting wages by roughly 25% in, in the public sector, wow. cutting pensions, again, by these kind of numbers, double digits, increasing taxes, uh, VAT to 24%, uh, and then doing all sorts of structural reforms in the public and private sector, all of which had the constituency behind it that simply did not want to budge. Hmm. You know, you open up the closed professions, you've got the truckers and the taxi drivers against you. You, uh, you, you tell the lawyers that uh, they, you know, they, they, no, they no longer can, can set tax fix rates, you've got the whole bar association against you. Uh, you tell the, the, the doctors that, you know, you've got to issue receipts. Oh, the medical association comes up and says, <laughs> but we are doctors, you know, we're not, you know. So, you know, this, this is a problem. When you do structural reforms, we were doing simultaneously a very tough fiscal consolidation exercise with difficult structural reforms. And it's very difficult, uh, politically, socially, it's impossible to do these things at the same time. Mm -hmm. Because basically you, you, you have everyone against you, the society as a whole, because everyone's living standard goes down, everyone's purchasing power, purchasing power is destroyed, people have kids in schools, in private schools, they need, you know, they need to pull them out, they've got two loans and two cars, which they shouldn't have had in the first place because uh, you know, they couldn't really afford it, but they did, so now they have to you know, roll back from that. A whole middle class suddenly finds that it's not as wealthy as it thought, and then we try to sort of shelter a little bit the most vulnerable by with those reductions being less, but it's impossible to, to shelter people. We try to make sure that the, the, the richest and the people with, with more uh, wealth and incomes bear more of the, of, the, of the adjustment, but again, it's not enough. It's not enough because everyone hurts. So, uh, you know, you enter into territory where even, even the negotiation itself was something that nobody had done before. The European Commission, the IMF, and the ECB had never before together negotiated with a member state this kind of a program. Mm -hmm. The Commission didn't know how to do this. The IMF did, but they have prescriptions from Latin America. They had to adjust them to a situation where uh, you had a, a, a currency which was fixed, so you couldn't devalue. And in the beginning, you couldn't also restructure the debt. Because when the IMF does this with other countries, the first two things they say, you devalue your currency, you restructure your debt. They couldn't do either in our case. <laughs> which means that a lot of the burden had to be on the real economy. And, and then we got it all wrong, right? We got the, the, what economists call the fiscal path. We were way over optimistic in terms of how quickly the Greek economy would rebound. Mm -hmm. My favorite comparison of the, the depth of the Greek crisis, and ma many people don't understand this, the only crisis that the Greek crisis is comparable with is the US Great Depression, 1929, 1932. Mm -hmm. GDP fell by about 27% in both cases. What's the big difference? The US Great Depression has a V-shape. It went down to 20, by 27% and within two years had rebounded. In the Greek crisis, it went down by 27%, but it was a U. And we're still somewhere here. We're not back up to where we were when we began. So imagine, you know, it's one thing when you go down and then back up, you, you know, your, 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 your living standards come back fairly quickly. But if you're for a decade there, that completely destroys the social fabric, it destroys the politics, it destroys the economy, it destroys everything. So during all that suffering and all that backlash and also the very difficult negotiations, did you ever doubt yourself? First of all, you never, I mean, I said before the finance minister are lonely, but the, you know, there's, there's advisors around you, you talk a lot with uh, you know, your fellow uh, members of, of government, you are constantly open line with your prime minister, you talk with your European partners. So, yes, I, I mean, uh, you, I never doubted that 
this was the only way to go. Every day I doubted individual decisions. If you don't doubt this kind of decisions, you're crazy. <laughs> but did I doubt, did I think that there was some other magic way that we get out of the hole where we had dug for ourselves? I never doubted that. Would I have hoped that the European, our European partners could have made that job easier and theirs as well at the same time? Yes, I, I, I hope that. But you have to make decisions with the politics at hand. And the politics of ha at hand uh, means, and so I'm switching a little bit to the European uh, side there, a very conservative uh, dominated Europe mm -hmm. that had a, a couple of countries this one was one of them. Uh, <laughs> Germany was another. Finland was a third that were intent on making sure that the Greeks were kind of, quote unquote, punished for their sins, right? Uh, and that meant a, a, the kind of adjustment process which was tougher than it should have been. Yeah. Back of the envelope calculations, we could have avoided one third of the, of the of the drop in GDP if we had been given a longer time horizon mm -hmm. and more money up front. Now, you would say, why more money up front? Well, in the end, the first bailout was 110 billion, then there was a second bailout for 130, and a third bailout for 85. If, we, you, know, if you go back and you could somehow magically turn, turn the time back, then you do a first bailout, which is bigger over a longer period, your economy does not tank that much, right? Mm -hmm. Because what's at the basis of a bailout agreement? What, what, what is it? The idea is this. You have to reduce your deficit. So you know that this is going to tank your economy. There's no way around it, right? Whoever says that you can do this without austerity is simply deluding themselves. The question is the degree of austerity. But at the same time, you hope that as you're doing this, markets will see this. Investment starts coming back and this pushes back the economy. So you have this, this equilibrating exercise. But we got that wrong. This went real deep, and this took a long time to come. Yeah. Well, you say you know, that people uh, thought uh, you couldn't do it without a bailout. Uh, you could have done it without a bailout, or you alluded. But you, in 2009, you mentioned that you wouldn't have never seen a bailout being an option for Greece. What made you change your mind? Um, well, into, <laughs> we were hoping to avoid a bailout. Mm -hmm. We could see it coming, but you're the finance minister. If you come out and say, I want a bailout, markets, because remember between October when we uh, went into government and uh, May uh, when the bailout was, until April, we were actually borrowing in international markets, mm -hmm. right? And we inc at increasingly higher interest rates, so it was becoming unsustainable, right? Yeah. The last one was about 6%. So, if you come out in October, November and say, I want a bailout, then financial markets say, okay, so this guy's bankrupt. <laughs> so from one day to the next, you completely stop uh, funding Greece. You completely yeah. stop lending Greece. And during that period, we did not have the guarantee from our European partners that they would come to our rescue. Yeah. The German narrative was, you do your job, meaning slash everything, and confidence will come back and the markets keep supporting you. So even when you mentioned that you would have never seen a bailout, it was always kind of in the back of your mind? Yes. Okay. It was always in the back of, of my mind and of our mind in general that if, if, if push came to shove, there was no other solution. There were a number of magical uh, solutions that people were floating. Go and, and borrow from the Chinese. Go and borrow from Russia. Yeah, great idea. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, go and borrow from whoever, the, you know, the, the, the Arab world. Um, none of these people give you money for free, yeah. right? And there's always strings attached. And I would rather have a structured program from our European partners than go and, and borrow money. And nobody was willing to give us that kind of money, right? But think of, you know, you, you borrow 10 billion from, from Russia. Well, what does that mean for your... Uh, your dependence on Russia. Think of doing the same thing with the Chinese. Yes, they would st still charge you interest and then you're beholden. So, you know, these, these ideas were very simplistic and wrong. Similarly with the ideas, oh, default. You know, default and don't pay your debts. Okay. <laughs> we had a primary deficit. Remember, primary, you default, right? So from one day to the next, you say, I no longer owe anything of the debt that I have. That's three percentage points of your 12 
percent de deficit. That means you have another nine percent, which means that your expenditures are nine percentage points higher than your revenues. So even if you don't have to pay interest and you're, you're, you forget your creditors, from one day to the next, you cannot fund your pensions, your public servants, your hospitals, your trains, anything. So this was not an option to simply say, oh, I'll default and then I'll be fine. No, you would not be. Yeah. Well, bringing back the discussion to nowadays, um, we see the Greek GDP still being only at two-thirds of pre-crisis level, despite three bailouts. Why is that? Okay, f so first of all, the, the, the bailouts were such that, that, the, that the actual fall in GDP was so much bigger. And, and part of it is a design fault. Part of it is our own fault, because unlike Portugal, we could not agree as political parties to support this th stuff. Portugal, they, they had one bailout, they went in, they went out, and they were fine, right? We had to have go through three. So part of it is politics, unfortunately, right? Yeah. Part of it w is, is that the, our European partners for a long time kept saying, oh, if Greece doesn't behave, it will get out of the Eurozone, which means that you're telling markets, you know, you can't go back and, and, and lend to Greece because there's what we call the redenomination risk. They may actually skid out of the Eurozone, so yeah. your debt to them is worthless. So all these reasons. But there's one final thing which is important to keep in mind. The 2008 GDP for Greece was a fictitious one. Okay. Because between 2000 and 2008, we grew a lot, but a lot of that growth was fueled by deficits hmm. and by imports. So some of it is, was not sustainable anyway, right? So it's not fair to say you're not back to your 2008 GDP. And would you say Greece is in a better position now or then before the crisis? It is certainly in a better position now than it has been in a very long time. Mm -hmm. Uh, it has kind of uh, fixed some of its structural problems. Has it fixed its problems in general? I would say no. We have not done the deeper institutional and political reforms which we should have done. Mm -hmm. It is not as easy to derail ourselves like we did before. But uh, if, if we want to be honest with ourselves, we missed a bit of a chance for a complete renewal of, of the political system. So yes, and if you look at the real at the numbers, you know, somebody can say to me, yeah, but I looked at debt to GDP yesterday, and actually it's at 170%, whereas in 2009 it was 130%. So how are you better off? Uh, the answer is GDP, debt has gone up for everyone. Mm -hmm. Our debt is a much longer, so you know we have to repay it over a longer time, and a big chunk of our debt is owned by the official sector. Yeah. So we're sheltered from the markets until we manage to grow ourselves enough to get out of there. Because remember, you never repay your debt as a country. You grow yourself out of it. This is something, you know, you, you never repay your debt. You just manage, hopefully, to grow out. Okay, well, I believe this is a very good time to look at our audience and see if someone has any questions, perhaps. Uh, we have one right in the back, or the way back. Behind you, yeah, there. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, IMF and uh, uh, the European Union wasn't, uh, didn't have uh, experience of uh, similar crisis uh, in Eurozone, but IMF had uh, experience in Latin countries where it could also use uh, um, devaluation of national currency. So I want to ask, uh, did you think of scenario where Greece goes from Euro to Drachma and uh, stays in the Eurozone uh, in the state of Denmark, for example, so with national currency, but inside the Eurozone? As a government, we never entertained that scenario. There was a government after us in 2015 that kind of did. And they even ran a referendum asking roughly that question. Not exactly, but roughly that question. And they even won that referendum saying no to the agreement, and then they looked at the precipice and they took a step back. So if you, first of all, Greece outside the Eurozone in the past does not have a stellar history of running fiscal accounts. So if you have a flexible currency, you have degrees of freedom, right? So you can, you can let your currency, but 
all these years, we had huge deficits, huge inflation. So it's not that we managed our flexible exchange rates well, right? So therefore, there's two questions here. I can say no to both questions. The easy question is, should Greece have left the euro? The answer of no is easy because if we had left the euro at, some po at that point, first of all, all your debt becomes denominated in your national currency, which vastly deteriorates. So suddenly, you've got a debt which is twice as big as you had before, right? You cannot pay that, so you could default, but then who's going to lend you afterwards? And the advantages of having a cheaper currency, for example, for tourism, do not outweigh the fact that everything else that you're importing, Greece imports most of its food stuff, it imports most of its energy, so it does not make sense to leave, plus the difficult transition, which is completely crazy. The more difficult question is, should Greece have come into the euro in the first place? My answer to shouldn't it is still no. In other words, yes, it should have gone into the euro, because it did provide stability at a high cost. Unfortunately, we did not figure out what we needed to do once we were in the Eurozone to be adapted and competitive as the other uh, nations of the Eurozone. So that, and that, that's, that's a lesson for many of the countries that are now trying to get into the Eurozone, which is that they get to get, need to get their act together before and not think that getting into the Eurozone has solved all their problems. So on the topic of Europe, um, regardless of the recovery of all your efforts to help the Greek economy recover, the crisis is very long and painful. Um, is that because of its unique characteristics, or was it because of the punishment by the IMF, by the EU, or a bit of both? Okay, so Europe really mishandled the Greek crisis. Let's be honest here. And it really mishandled the Eurozone crisis overall. Let me start by saying that I'm very glad that in the end they came to our support, but they were too late. And I can say this because I have, you know, done the self-flagellation in the first half of our discussion, right? All the things that we did wrong, right? So now let's talk about what the Europeans did wrong. So they were very late coming in. They completely misunderstood the nature of the crisis and their prescriptions were wrong. They were late because they thought that it could be solved because they pretended to think that this could be solved as a Greek problem and because politics actually drove their reactions. So the elections in uh, a part of Germany and the fact that the, the, the party of Mrs. Merkel's party at the time did not want to go to, uh, to agree on a bailout for Greece before May because they had the critical election, did not want to lose, shows to you that the decisions were not made on, on economic terms, but on political terms. So one, they were late. Two, they did not realize what the nature of the crisis. This was a systemic crisis of the Eurozone, and it wasn't even a fiscal crisis. At its root was a banking crisis. Greece happened to have a particular fiscal problem, but behind it was the problem in the financial sector of the EU. As we saw in Ireland, because Ireland went under and had its own bailout, which is a purely banking bailout, as we saw in Spain, which got its own banking bailout. And they, so the, 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 the roots of the crisis was in the incomplete construction of the Eurozone. So they misunderstood the nature of the crisis and this made them, and that's the third point, give the wrong prescriptions. Yes, Greece needed a heavy dose of austerity, less than what we got, but we needed it because we were out there. But at the same time, all the other countries stepped on the brakes as well. That was crazy. In the middle of the crisis, the ECB increased interest rates. Crazy. And countries that had a lot of fiscal space also reduced expenditures when they should not have done so. So, and I think, to be fair, a lot of political leaders and institutions have come out and have uh, uh, sort of done ex post assessments showing how the EU got it wrong. And here's an interesting comparison here. Compare the reaction of the EU to the Eurozone crisis, so Greece and the other countries, to the reaction of EU to COVID, the economic reaction, not the health reaction, the economic reaction. Okay, okay you've got two different crises. One is asymmetric, 
So you've got one country or a few. Uh, the other one goes on everyone. It goes on everyone. It's the same thing. It's a virus. There's, you know, one is because of some wrong policies. The other one, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, there's an advantage to that, which means that in the Eurozone crisis, you had the virtues and the sinners. You had the creditors and the debtors. In the COVID crisis, you don't have that. We're all on the same boat, right? So yes, it's a different crisis. But we learned. We learned from the Eurozone crisis. We learned that when you have this kind of a crisis, you do what the Americans did in the global financial crisis a few years before the Eurozone crisis. You put the big bazooka on the table. And you pull all the stops. And you use all the means and tools and policies that you have in your... So yes, the ECB goes through the pandemic uh, purchase program and buys bonds like there's no tomorrow because you've got to do it, otherwise the health crisis becomes a financial crisis. Yes, you relax the stability and growth pact and allow countries to, as we did in, 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 the, in COVID, to allow countries to spend because otherwise what is a, you know, we're stopping the economy but we need to keep paying people to keep it going. And yes, you create new instruments like we did with the next generation EU, uh, which is collective borrowing but what is a collective problem? None of these things were there in 2009. And you will definitely get to that. Um, <laughs> but yeah. I'm jumping ahead. Yes, I no, mean. I mean, we're <laughs> also okay. as excited it's about, uh, about it as you. Um, so you mentioned the subject of Ireland, who also made use of quote unquote artistic freedom when they talked about their own financials. But the crisis that was much more due to the banking system being irresponsible. Would such a crisis have been better because it would have focused on more sustainable, re, uh, the EU could have focused on more sustainable me measures, namely remaking the banking system as opposed to like really punishing Greece? You know, one of the most fun things you can do when you're uh, an academic is to think about counterfactuals. What if, right? One of my favorite what ifs is, remember the, the timing, the sequence, Greece, kind of went down in May 2010. Ireland went down in November 2010. So my favorite what if is, what if Ireland had fallen first? What if somehow we could have hang in there and Ireland was the first one to go bust? The answer to that question is, okay, we can think whatever we want because you know we're in counterfactual territory so we can make up our own story, right? So my... My scenario there is that then the European Union would have seen the Eurozone crisis much more as a banking crisis than as a pure fiscal crisis. This would have meant, A, that you would not have seen everything through the lens of austerity, because basically because of Greece, everything was a nail and you had a hammer, right? And B, we would have gotten the banking union much earlier than we got it, yeah, right? Really so it it's a counterfactual, you know, I can't prove it in any way, but I do think that the fact that Ireland came after us, we painted the narrative of the crisis in particular ways, which is, these guys overspend, nobody should be overspending, let's all reduce our, our expenditures, that's the real problem. No, that's not the real problem. Like in the US, a big part of the Eurozone problem was a banking crisis. Its roots were in the banking system and how the US uh, global financial crisis had mutated over to Europe. Yeah, well, linking back to the discussion we were having before, you were mentioning many political uh, mistakes and kind of characteristics that led to the severity of the crisis, but the structural characteristics of the EU were also not really in your favor. And, um, you know, common currency implied, as you said many times during this interview, that you couldn't devaluate your currency. Do you believe we would have talked of not such a long and painful crisis like we do now if Greece had monetary policy authority? Well, if to have monetary policy authority, you have to have your own currency. Yeah. Uh, and no, if we had our own currency, I do not think... Uh, we would have avoided some of the perhaps kind of fictitious boom that we had. Uh, but again, I look back at Greece's history. When we had our own currency, we made also pretty mess of it, right? Greece has defaulted four or five times in its history, in its modern history. We're not alone, right? Other countries, Spain, others, have also defaulted. But we have a history of, of defaults, which means that the institutions were not there. 
the hope was that when you get into the euro, you also build institutions. But what we did not collectively realize that doing the nominal convergence criteria, those of you doing European uh, EU economics know the Maastricht criteria and how you sort of uh, have to fulfill them. But that's nominal convergence. We left aside the real convergence. We, and the real convergence about how your economy, your institutions adapt. And that we did not do. So, well, you don't believe that the Greek crisis is then an example of that perhaps giving up monetary independence is maybe too much of a high price to join a monetary union like the EU? No, I do not think it is too much. I think that, well, first of all, I think Europe is a collective which goes way beyond fiscal and monetary policy. It yeah. is, uh, but here we're talking about the Eurozone. We're not talking about the EU, right? So we're talking about, because the EU is a different discussion. The Eurozone is a subset of the discussion about the EU. Uh, but the, 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 the there is an advantage to being in the Eurozone, and this has been documented in different ways, but that does not mean that being in the Eurozone gives you free reign to run what ki whatever kind of fiscal policy you want. Yeah. And unfortunately, the kind of guardrails that were there were not strong enough. Part of the problem was that, yes, the Greek political system could not keep its accounts straight, but the European political system did also not want to check on Greece. Mm -hmm. Partly, why, there's an interesting anecdote here, why did Eurostat not have audit powers? Well, because France and Germany vetoed it at some point. Why did they veto it? Well, because they were also contravening, they were also not adhering to the, S to the stability and growth huh. pact early yeah. on. So, you know, we're paying collective mistakes here. So moving a little bit from the past to now, you've already mentioned next generation's EU recovery plan. Um, and I think a key difference in terms of crisis management was the transpayment that countries could earn by sustainable economic practices. Do you think in this case, the carrot approach might be better than the stick approach that they use in your case? Uh, the, well, there is always, there's a, Yes, it's a carrot and stick in the sense that if you don't do the reforms, you don't get the money, right? Um, you kind of always need a bit of a carrot and stick. What we have now is a different type of conditionality. I think the big difference with our case is that here, the narrative is you do the reforms and the investments, and we give you money for it. In the Greek case is, we, if you don't do these things, you will die basically, <laughs> because we will stop giving you money and you default, right? So, yes, it is much more positive. Remember, you need to lubricate the, the economic system to be able also to do difficult reforms. And when I say lubricate, I don't mean sort of pay people off, but I mean, if you, if you want to do reforms, I mean, I'll give you a very simple example. You want to reform your educational system and make sure that teachers are assessed, and they improve their skills, well, you need to pay them properly. If you're cutting the salaries by 20% and you're asking them to do all this other stuff, they'll say, no, I'm not gonna do it, right? It's, and that carries over. You want to, to change your, your health system and you know, modernize your hospitals and bring in modern practices and have better services for your patient. You need money for that, right? We were asked to, at the same time, improve things, but with less money. It doesn't compute. Yeah, absolutely. Another really topical thing, and you know, it's being discussed in the European Parliament as we speak right now, is the new economic governance review. And basically, this aims at achieving public debt sustainability through a more individual and flexible approach compared to the numerical fixation you mentioned yourself in the Maastricht Treaty. Do you believe this is the right way to go for Europe? Look, we, we could have a, a long discussion about the specifics of the reform that has been adopted, right? I think it's in the right direction. I think it's missing some elements. If you look at it narrowly, I think it kind of pretty much holds water. If you look at it more broadly, it's missing, for example, uh, a, a common safe asset, which we badly need, a stabilization fund, which we badly need. Mm -hmm. It misses the idea of investment in European public goods, which we badly need. So, you know, it depends on how you see the conversation. If the conversation, the, what we have is a, a revision of the narrow core of the European governance system, which is the stability and growth pact and its rules, and it is a compromise, which kind of works, 
but it's not a perfect one. But it misses out on the broader elements which I would have liked to be part of the conversation. Yeah, so you've talked a lot about, in previous interviews, about the need of the EU to learn from crises and a crisis and learning moment. You talk here about things that the EU still has to do and needs to do better. What are some key lessons you believe the EU has still yet to learn from, just in general, yeah? Okay, um, there's some simple lessons uh, which I think uh, European policymakers took a long time to understand. One is how you deal with the markets. You know, we used to think that we shouldn't think too much about markets. Well, unfortunately, you've got to think about the markets. Because, Why unfortunately? Sorry? Why unfortunately? Well, because uh, you would like as a politician to think that you are the ultimate arbiter mm -hmm. uh, and that your, you, your decisions are impervious of what markets tell you. Well, you're funding yourself on international financial markets. Therefore, you cannot ignore. Italy, for example, look at the country where I teach at the moment and where the European University Institute is. You have a fairly right-wing government, right? Pretty much out there. Its economic policy is kind of not straying too much uh, because it is afraid of what the implication will be uh, of financial markets, given that Italy has the second highest uh, debt to GDP ratio in the Eurozone. Now, is that good, the fact that financial markets act as a discipline? No, it isn't, right? It is, we just we cannot ignore them, we can also not be, not be slaves to them, right? Uh, and we need to be smart about them. For example, during the Eurozone crisis, uh, we realized that credit rating agencies were simply a bit of a joke. Yeah. Yeah. Because in the beginning of the crisis, they completely missed it. And then once the crisis happened, they started downgrading everyone uh, without looking at the fact that there was a collective willingness to support Greece and the other countries. So in that sense, one of the, one of the big lessons is you have to know how to deal with financial markets. The second lesson is you cannot avoid things because they will come back and bite you. Uh, and, and these are very simple lessons, right? Uh, they're not particularly sophisticated lessons. Then you need to have two hands. You've got a fiscal policy and a monetary policy. You've got to use them both. For a long time, we were only using monetary policy because we were not willing to, uh, to use fiscal policy because of uh, uh, kind of mental states in particular countries. So these are some of the simple lessons. Uh, at, remember this, at the end of the day, the actual policy decisions are at a very delicate intersection between economics and politics. It is what economics tells you you should be doing, but it's also what politics allows you to do. So when you're formulating policy, if you don't understand the political uh, environment that you're with, uh, that you have to deal with, then you will not be able to advance the agenda. The idea, many people talk about reform in the EU, windows of opportunity. And that's when kind of stars align in the sense that there is a majority of countries willing to move the ball forward, right? We're not in that space, unfortunately, right now. Okay, well, I believe we have um, a bit of time for one quick last audience question. Uh, At the front, yeah. right there. Hello, thank you for being here. I had a question about the 3% deficit rule in Europe. I know it has been postponed, if I can say, during the COVID crisis, and since then we have many discussions. So what's your opinion about it? Yeah, th there is a particular logic to the 3% rule, uh, it, which has to come back, which goes back to nominal growth rates of about 5%, right? So if you end where you want your debt to end up, uh, if you believe that long-term nominal growth rates are no longer going to be 5%, as was the original idea when, the, when the, 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 the rule was adopted, then you should revise it upwards, right? Is that the right battle to fight, is the question. Politically, I'm not so sure. I'm not hung up on that. I, I was much more of the idea that we should kind of real, recognize the reality 
that 60% debt to GDP is silly. The average at the moment is 80 plus, right? So uh, we should recognize that reality and work with that. But I do not think we should be too hung up on the nominal figures, certainly not the 3%, probably less so the 60%, Let's think of the kind of rules that are intelligent enough and flexible enough to be able to not completely stifle growth while keeping sane and sustainable public finances. You can still do that with those rules in place as long as you have a, a corpus of, of interpretation and rules around them, even if you don't change the headline numbers. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we are a little bit tight for One time, more question, but I see like someone very eager. Uh, <laughs> oh, do we have the mic? Sorry. Uh, good, af good afternoon, Rolf Beetsma. I'm a member of the European Fiscal Board, so I'm very much <laughs> involved in this. Um, on the debt, you say the 60%. Um, the 60% is a figure that was in a way rather arbitrary in that, you know, it was the average, of course, at the time, uh, you know, I think the Maastricht Treaty was signed, etc. But, and now the reality is, I don't know, eight, 90% on average with peaks that are way higher. Um, the precise number 60 or 55 or 65 is not that important, but I think it's important that, you know, two days debts, in my view, are too high. Because we've seen, for example, in the case of Sweden, beginning of the 90s, there was a banking crisis and suddenly there was 25, 30 percent percentage points more debt. A couple of years ago, Olivier Blanchard with co-authors, they said, yeah, okay, I mean, uh, money is almost, uh, eh, the interest rates are zero, so you know, governments can borrow much more. Now, today's situation is way different. So I, I'm very much in favor, and I think as European Fiscal Board, we really are in favor of, you know, to be careful, conservative, and, you know, have debts to, to, go, uh, to go down. I, I would like to hear your answer to that. Okay, um, we're trying to square a very different circle here. If you think ahead, you've got the climate transition, which is going to cost us a lot of money. You've got social spending in the EU, which is going to increase because of aging societies and the like. You've got competitiveness lagging, where we need to invest in innovation and digital. So the question is, how do we do all these things to remain relevant at the world stage while not going completely crazy? Okay. And the US has a way to do it, and it's called the dollar, hmm. right? China has kind of a way to do it. We don't really know how, but you know, they have also some significant problems which are brewing there. So we have to find a way to invest in the European future, because if we don't, we're going to be irrelevant without blowing up the bank. And I think the, the, the solution to that is through rethinking around European public goods and collective investments. Now, you can say that this is also debt. Yes, it is also debt, but it's collective debt that we undertake all together. And that's why I said before, I'm not too hung up on, on the number because we do need to have some anchors, right? Because yes, you're right, in crisis, you have a huge, and then we need to come, come back. I don't think we'll come back to 60%. I think we can, we can have sustainability at higher levels. Are they 80, are they 100? I don't really know exactly. You know, sustainability at the end of the day is at the eye of the beholder. It's what the markets tell you is sustainable, okay? There's some fundamentals which are underlying that, but these keep moving. So how do we do this exactly? This is the difficult conversation that we're not really having because you cannot, one cannot simply say, I'm not saying you said that, let's stick to the 60% and ignore everything else. And I cannot simply say, let's invest like crazy to the digital transition and everything else and forget about it. So there's got to be an equilibrium between the two and we have to find it. Um, so that's lovely and starting to wrap up. Um, so you have fought for Greece to stay in Europe at tremendous personal and societal costs when many people didn't think it could be done. 
After all that trouble, you are now the acting head, head of the School of Transnational Governments at the European University Institute in Florence. Why do you love Europe so much? Oh, and by the way, I'm hoping that a number of you may at some point want to come and take a master's with us. Uh, <laughs> you should check us, our master's in transnational governance. Great, fantastic. This was the pitch, right? So why do I love Europe so much? Well, you know, I got married to a Dutch lady. I have two sons that are half Greek, half Dutch. I feel European. I think we have a common destiny, destiny and identity, uh, even though we're all at the same time, you know, uh, Greeks, Dutch, Italians, Spaniards, whatever. It's, I mean, I think that for, for the majority of, of your generation, it's a state of being, right? Uh, it's not for the majority of Europeans, uh, and it's of, often not in the, in the older generation, which is part of the problem that is feeding populism in many of our countries. But I could not see any other future. Uh, we are in a world which is becoming tougher, where systemic competition between blocks is going to be the name of the day. If we all retreated into our little corner and did not leverage the EU for what it is, which is a middle to big power only if we act together on all fields, and if we don't become more federalist, then I think we will simply sink into the irrelevance that our numbers compared with the growing uh, global population mean. Uh, so it's a one-way street. It's yeah. part the heart and part the mind. Yeah, well, you said yourself that you love, you know, make scenarios. Do you see the United States of Europe ever being something possible? I see us, well, it's, it's a hope. Uh, uh, it's, I see us coming, to, coming more together to, through, through, uh, to a number, through a number of policies. I think through COVID, we understood uh, some mistakes and we corrected them. In the Ukraine crisis, we are understanding, for example, how you have to have a common energy policy in Europe uh, and you need a common defense policy and security because it's a tough world out there. Are we ever going to get to a federal state? I'm not sure. Uh, I'm willing to not, you know, I, I don't, I'm willing to compromise if we just continue to work together and work closer together on, on a lot of policy issues. Well, I believe that wraps up very well the spirit of this interview. Professor Papa Constantinou, thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's been a real pleasure and we hope all the best for your future. I would like to thank our audience as well for being here as usual. And for those of you who can't get enough of us, with us, of us which I can imagine, um, so on February 6th, we will have the pleasure of hosting Bert Hoffman, the former World Bank Director for China. February 14th, the, the pleasure of Tuan House, the host of College Tour, as well as like a pretty famous journalist. And for those of you who want to talk more about the EU and the EU uh, elections coming up, we have the academic on EU and EU decision making, also from the EUI, a uh, great school, um, <laughs> Professor Simon Hicks. Uh, I hope I'll see you all, all there, and thank you again to Professor Papa Constantino. Thank you all for thank being you. here. Thanks very much. <laughs>